So let's talk about our noble super heavy war machines and crush the enemies of the Imperium with extreme chivalry underneath the adamantium feet of the Imperial Knights. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today we're talking Imperial Knights, and I thought we'd do an army overview for the faction, talking through the codex in its entirety, with some of the strongest rules from the various sections of the book, going through their datasheets, and finishing up with a couple of strong army lists. The 9th edition codex I think has been easily the most interesting book for the knights that Games Workshop's ever released, really quite in-depth rules and multiple layers that you can stack on your mighty nobles, plus some pretty nice army synergies with the armagers and their bondsmen abilities. They're very strong in game at the moment, so let's talk about some of their best ways of dominating the foe with their brutal titanic chain swords and massive firepower. So, so far, Imperial Knights in 9th edition have been on a bit of an upward trajectory. Early in the edition, they basically had little to no chance of competing whatsoever. The objectives and terrain rules just made them massively at a big handicap. Having no objective secured and only counting as one model, it basically made it impossible for them to win missions at all, and any raw power that they had just wasn't anywhere near enough to carry them. Now, since the codex dropped, they're just far, far stronger. Games Workshop's done a whole bunch of things that have actually adapted their rules to the edition and made them playable. And I think they've done pretty well to make a fairly strong and flexible army with the vast majority of the units usable. And it's kind of cool to be able to make some really interesting combos between the different big and smaller knights. Before the codex, they always used to be a bit monolithic in each model just doing what it wanted to do. And basically not really caring about any of the other models in your army. In Nephilim, they're certainly one of the stronger armies in 40k right now. They've got a very solid win percent of 52%. And they've taken their share of grand tournaments as well. Five big event wins that I can count plus absolutely tons of podium placements, with lots of lists just missing out on the top spot. They seem to be both an army that does pretty well on its own steam, and also can function at the very highest levels of play, while also not really being one of the very, very top armies of the game, so a fairly feel-good faction to play at the moment, I think. In terms of the army strengths and weaknesses, I'd say perhaps one of the biggest strengths is just the fact that every single point is dedicated into big fighting machines rather than messing around with grunt objective holders or characters or anything. It just gives the army a whole ton of raw power overall, lots of big guns, lots of wounds in tough vehicles, and you can't really afford to ignore just about any unit out of the entire army. In particular, the armages I think are just very efficient, they're incredibly tough with minus one damage, and well worth their points. Otherwise, the armages provide the army with fast-moving objective secured, meaning that they're really quite strong on the primary, where once they were weak, the bigger knights get powerful layered synergies and combos, with multiple stacking relics, warlord traits, and other bits going on. The faction secondaries are good ones, Generally, you can afford to take all the knight ones if you want to, and generally do quite well. We'll go over them a bit in a bit more detail in a second. And in terms of command points, they perhaps have life easier than just about any other faction in Nephilim. They certainly want to spend a fair bit pre-game, but with an easy oath effectively nesting them 5 free CP over the course of the game, knights are generally going to have no trouble with big damage combos, and using a ton of stratagems they wouldn't normally be able to. As for weaknesses, they are an army that is a bit of a skew list, which has its disadvantages. Being all vehicles does mean that if you run into an army that's just taken an excessive amount of anti-tank, you could find it a real uphill struggle. Plus, you'll be giving up secondaries like bring it down really quite easily. Most opponents should be able to take that fairly comfortably against most knight lists. Terrain's also generally far more of a hindrance than it is a help for knights, particularly for the super heavy ones where they can be shot from behind obscuring terrain. And the fact that the army is all vehicles does lock them out of a bunch of options. Say, for example, that there are certain secondaries that they just can't do and maybe certain battlefield situations where it would have been much better to use some infantry, but they only have vehicles available. I guess they are always going to play a bit weirdly compared with other armies that aren't all vehicles, but they certainly seem to be holding their own at the moment, and are in a pretty good spot right now. Getting into the actual codex rules, let's first start with the core rules, and then go over some of the specific sections in turn. Knights have quite a lot of core rules, just to make their army a bit more functional, with the 9th edition mission and detachment rules, First up, their Knight Lances are far more lenient than the Punishing Super Heavy Detachment, which costs 6 CP. You get to refund 3 CP out of that if you have 1 or 2 Questorists and 3 to 5 Armagers, and get to refund the full 6 CP if you have 3 or more Questorists, or at least 1 Titanic Knight and 6 plus Armagers. In general, that covers you for most situations, though it can be quite annoying in some combos not quite working. Say, for example, it weirdly punishes taking, say, 2 Questorists, 1 Dominus, and a couple of Armagers as that one has the potential just to slip through the cracks of the two different rules. In general though, maybe not too hard to meet the requirements. 
Then the knights have their objective rules, objective secured for armagers that count as 5 models, and then the titanic knights don't count as obsec, but do count as 10 models, so again can still be quite hard to take objectives off. Generally imperial knight lists tend to go at least fairly heavy on the armagers, having a whole ton of them scooting around all over the place taking objectives very easily can be a bit of a nightmare, and they are quite hard to kill. Next up, the entire faction is covered in Ion Shields, a 5 plus envelope range that you can rotate for 1 or 2 CP to become a 4 plus. That's quite nice against any Melter or high AP things, but it does mean that weirdly a lot of knights can be easier to kill in melee compared with what they are at range. Particularly I find that the big knights can fall apart a bit if you are hit by something nasty in melee and even just a bunch of damage to weapons. The Super Heavy Walker special rule applies to the Titanic knights, this allows the big knights to move across things that aren't monsters or vehicles, so not just get bogged down by a thin screen of infantry or something, and it means that knights as titanic units can then fall back, shoot and charge as well. So provided you're not playing with certain oaths or anything, you can just freely walk out of combat, deal damage to whatever you like, and then charge something completely different. It's a pretty nice thing and can make them hard to pin down, but of course being titanic does have its own disadvantages, such as not being able to make use of dense cover or obscuring terrain both of which generally just make it a lot easier for them to get shot. Bondsman abilities are a common thing throughout Imperial Knights. Generally the Questorists have these, and they can select an armager within 12 inches for a minus 1 damage buff, provided the army as a whole is honoured or virtuous, which it usually should be. The Exalted Court upgrades are usually very popular, as it allows you to select two different armagers for those buffs, and each Questorist Knight also gives its own flavour of buff to the armagers, but to be honest the minus 1 damage is just pretty amazing all by itself. It's such a powerful rule that most knight armies will be made up of a decent mix of Questorists and armagers, rather than say Chaos Knights which might want to build an army entirely out of war dogs. Finally we've got the Code Chivalric, which we'll cover in a second, a system of honour points, pledges and troughs. The Code Chivalric is the Imperial Knight's pure army rule, so you get this if you're not including any Imperial allies, besides certain things like Agents of the Imperium and Inquisitors and stuff. For the honour points, your army naturally starts at one honour point, and then you gain and lose them based on the pleasures and troughs of the oaths that you've picked. If you've got one to four honour points, then you're honoured, and you get one buff per oath that you've picked, and if you're on a five or six, then you get virtuous, and that unlocks a second buff for each of the oaths. In general, it's really not too hard to avoid dropping down to zero and becoming dishonoured. That will be a bit of a disaster for several armies, though. The way that the oaths work is that you pick two out of a set of four of them, record them on the army list, and then they'll give you some powerful buffs and also those missions that you need to achieve and things that you need to avoid. For me, the oaths kind of have three different tiers. I'd say the Defend the Realm one is so good that it's basically auto-include for me. This is the one that while you're honoured, you gain plus one CP for each battle round in your command phase. It's not the opponent command phase, just yours, but still 5 CP over the course of a Nephilim game really adds up to quite a lot. You'll be able to rotate a lot more Iron Shields and use a lot more really powerful Knight stratagems. On top of that, the Pledge and Troth are both really quite easy. The Pledge is that at the end of your turn you control more objective markers than your opponent does, on plenty of missions that's not going to be too hard to achieve, ideally you want to be flipping those objectives with your objective secured armages, and it should happen naturally while you're trying to win the primary. On top of that, the troth is really quite hard to do, it means that you have to actually move off objective markers and control fewer than at the start of the turn, that's never normally going to happen unless your knights get slain in combat during your own turn. Finally, if you're virtuous, your models gain obsec and count as three extra models if you'd already had it, and objective secured big knights are very nice indeed. The vast majority of knight lists tend to take that one, it's really really good. Otherwise, for the other oaths, I do think that literally any of the other three are usable, though judging by a successful knight tournament list, the other two quite popular ones are Protect Those in Need and Lay Low the Tyrants. Protect Those in Need, again, is quite an easy one to get some honour points from, perform heroic interventions, or to charge against a unit that was already locked up. You only lose points if you choose to avoid combat, and the honoured ability gives you a heroic intervention army-wide. Characters can do so at 6 inches. Virtuous allows you to use bondsman abilities twice if you have them. Heroic Intervention is really nice for defending objectives that your opponent might want to try and take away from your Warglaives, and the Virtuous one is very good if you're playing with a list that's very heavy in Armagers. It means that one knight's big buffs will be going further. Lay Low the Tyrant is maybe a bit more of a gamble. You do get some very nice extra damage with re-rolling one hit roll or one wound roll whenever you're shooting or fighting, and with the amount of high power knight attacks and shots that you get, that's going to add up to a lot of extra damage. The Pledge is killing characters, monsters or vehicles in melee, not too hard to do, but not easy against every list, 
and the Troth is failing to destroy two enemy units this battle round, which is going to happen from time to time. I feel like this is maybe the one that you're most likely to lose honor points on, but you do get some flat damage increase for it, plus the Virtuous ability gives you an automatic 6 once per turn. Finally, Refuse No Challenge I still think is pretty decent for a melee list. The honored ability gives it plus 1 to hit in the first round of combat, and Virtuous allows you to re-roll advance and charge rolls. To gain points, you need to kill two units in melee in the battle round. That's not going to happen every round for certain, and the Troth is falling back with anything, which is sometimes kind of annoying, and sometimes it can be very helpful to do so. Still seems pretty usable though, particularly if you're using something like Mass Armager Warglaives or something. In general though, I think it's hard to go too far wrong with the free command points, plus one of these three. Moving on, let's talk through some of the rule sections of the Codex, and we'll start out with the Warlord traits. You can opt to buy a knight two of these with the Revered Knight stratagem if you want to, so you can stack them quite high. First up, Iron Bulwark is great. A 4 plus invul against ranged attacks is not a bad thing. It makes a shooty knight significantly better, and that one's quite a popular one. Revered Knight allows you to start the game with an extra honor point, and allows you to fight first as well. That's quite nice for making sure the honor system works in your favor, and say if you do get a bit unlucky early in the game with something like Lay Low the Tyrants, it still means that you won't drop into Dishonored, which could be quite bad. Knight Seneschal is really quite a nice one for melee knights, plus one attacks, and you get to retain the Code Chivalric even if you're Dishonored. Just the plus one attack alone is really quite nice when you're using knight combat weapons, it's going to be a solid damage boost. And finally we've got Blessed by the Sacristans, this one allows you to do mortal wounds on sixes when shooting, Really quite nice for Crusaders with a bunch of shots, or Knight Castellans. It'll just add up to a few random scattered mortal wounds every time you shoot. Even if you just average something like 2 mortal wounds a turn out of this, that would add up to 10 over the course of the game. Not too bad for a 1 CP investment in my book. Otherwise, for Relics, the Knights really are spoilt for choice here I think. There's an absolute ton of usable ones, and there's more besides this. Perhaps arguably one of the more standout relics of the book for more competitive lists is the Helm Dominatus. This one's good because Bondsman abilities are good, and it means that one bonded armager each turn gets to remain bonded for the rest of the game. The effect doesn't fade away. It means that you could have something like a Knight Paladin and goes around buffing more and more armagers as the game progresses. It's a really solid one if you want to use slightly more armagers than you have Questorus Knights in your army. Otherwise, there's all sorts of great choices. Sanctuary gives you a 4 plus invul in melee. Very nice for any knight that's being a bit more aggressive. Endless Fury gives you an extra d6 shots on Avenger Gatling cannons. Rarely going to be a bad thing, and that'll be a decent amount of extra damage. Judgment is an interesting damage d3 plus 3 missile pod that gets to ignore line of sight. That can put a surprising amount of hurt on something that should ideally be safe. The Mentor's Seal is pretty nice for a Preceptor. More reliable teachings. The Bastard's Helm gives you plus 1 to wound for 2 armagers. Really nice for Moiraxes or Helverins, I think. The Heart of Ion is a decent damage buff, you get to cut one wound on your knight and get one weapon be plus one to wound, really quite nice for an Avenger Gatling cannon or occasionally in melee if it makes sense, and the Banner of Macarius Triumphant gets you an extra honor point and obsec for Imperialist knights, both of which are pretty handy things for knights in general. A whole ton of flexibility with these, it's really quite nice they've managed to make so many of them viable and not just have a couple of auto include choices. Next in line for character upgrades, we have the Exalted Court. These are the points cost upgrades for your Imperial Knights, and they're the ones that allow you to use two Bondsman abilities every turn, which is worth quite a lot just in itself. Otherwise though, these upgrades also tend to give you one boost to your Knight itself, plus something to make its Bondsman abilities even better somehow, either affecting more armages or layering even more buffs on them. Even amongst top tier competitive lists, it does seem that people really like to choose different ones of these, I feel like literally every single one in the table is usable, and it's kind of cool that they encourage different builds of a knight army, for say whether you're building around a herald or a princeps or something like that. In terms of value for the points, my favourites are probably the princeps, master of vox and herald, though as I said I think literally any of the others are very usable as well, it just depends on what sort of buffs that you want for the knight army. First up, Princeps is a really interesting one for the Mechanicus Knight. The big thing that that gives you is the ability to apply a Bondsman ability to a big knight. You don't get the minus one damage, but you do get the effect. And perhaps the most common way to use it is to use a Knight Paladin, where you get reroll ones to hit and to wound, and then put that on literally any Questorist Knight, where you're going to get good value out of that. Maybe in particular, a Crusader can be a good target. On top of that, it also gives you a 5 plus chance to prevent an honor point being lost as well. So combos quite nicely with things like Lay Low the Tyrants where you might lose them from time to time. Master of Vox is 20 points and that's also a Mechanicus one. 
that allows you to basically broadcast your bondsman ability anywhere on the table. Quite nice if you've got armagers running around all over the place, you can literally put the buffs on the ones that need it the most, as much for the minus one damage as anything else sometimes. On top of that, it also lets you farm command points on a 5 plus as well whenever you spend one. And combined with the extra CP for the oath, it means that Nightlist can be absolutely swimming in command points. On the Imperialist side of things, perhaps the Herald is one of the most interesting. This one allows you to broadcast Bondsman buffs through it. So a big knight, maybe a bit further back, could cast its Bondsman abilities through this knight if they're chained out. But to be honest, far more importantly is the Armager buff that it gets. When you use your Bondsman abilities on the Armagers, as well as getting minus one damage, they get a four plus invul save as well, both at range and in melee, which is pretty mad. Armagers can be pretty tough to take down, even just with the minus one damage and their ion shields and things. Getting a four plus invul on them is absolutely amazing, just as part of the Bondsman ability. And what's more, this ability is really quite a cheap one as well. I'd say those three maybe give you some of the biggest bang for the buck, but to run through the rest of the list quickly, High Monarch is an expensive one, but lets you buff multiple different armagers with the Bondsman things. If you had a whole swarm of them, you could get them all bonded. And it also allows you to double down on earning honor points sometimes. Monarch's Ward can be used to protect other knights nearby, give them kind of character protection, and allows fights first armagers. Master of Law is a Mechanicus one that allows you your knights to gain a teaching, and you can stack multiple Bondsman abilities on the same armager if you have ones going spare. The teaching is pretty cool to be honest. You could maybe have things like a 6 plus fill no pain going off if you do manage to cast it. Gatekeeper and Forge Master feel like two sides of the same coin. They both make your knights tougher in their own deployment zone, plus some extra armager buffs to make them tougher or stronger as well. And Master of Justice and Master Tactician, again, feel like two sides of the same coin for Imperialis or Mechanicus. They both get to pick one of the martial traditions from the Free Blades and layer it on their own model. Plus you get a once per game free stratagem for an armager too, so that could also save you some CP. I do really quite like this table and the amount of flexibility that you can get when building lists. Moving on, we've got generic stratagems, and the knight ones have quite a lot of easy ones where you can just increase damage or defense in some way, and have a few other interesting tricks. I'd say perhaps one of the highest value ones on the codex might actually be full tilt though, 1 CP for a 9 inch auto advance on armagers, or a 6 inch auto advance on titanics. This one's particularly scary on the knight errant who can make an armager warglaive auto advance and charge, so in theory you've got a warglaive moving 21 inches and still able to charge there, which is pretty mad. This one's pretty good just for getting your knights to objectives when they need to as well. Often it can be 1 CP, just trades out directly for victory points. Otherwise, a lot of the stratagems cost more if they're on Questorius knights than on armagers. A few of those are martial prowess, plus 1 to saves in melee. Quite nice if you're getting hit by something with relatively low AP. Machine Spirit Resurgent allows you to fight on full profile for Mechanicus knights. That one's a bit of a staple if you're in your bottom bracket. Noble Sacrifice is an auto-explode one for a knight. That's once per game, but to be honest, I think usually it's going to be worth it at least once per battle. In particular, it's quite nice just on an armager for a cheap 1 CP. Maybe you push one up to a middle objective and then the enemy absolutely swarms it. You could be dealing out something like 10 mortal wounds with the armager's big base. As mentioned before, Rotate Iron Shields gives you that 4 plus envelope range. Really quite a solid defensive boost, and it can be often worth just having 2 CP spare at the start of the game, just to make sure that you can actually do that on the big knights, to try and have some insurance against them getting shot down turn 1. Finally, I think Chain Sweep's a common, very usable one. 1 CP for extra attacks with the sweep profile of a Questorus Reaper Chain Sword, or an Armager Chain Cleaver. If you just really need to cut through as many infantry in a single turn, for 1 CP that could hopefully get you a couple more dead ones. Next up, we've got the Knight Secondaries. And the Imperial Knight ones, I would say, are very, very solid. Some codexes struggle to have any solid ones to pick, but the Knight ones can often take all of their standard three, and only choose to sub them out if it makes sense given the matchup. I'd say perhaps the best of this, and the one that looks like it's most commonly taken in tournaments, is Yield No Ground. This one basically just rewards you with victory points for doing what you wanted to do anyway, trying to hold half or more of the objectives, clearing your own deployment zone of enemies each turn, and then a weird one where you can either not fall back or move towards your own board edge, and if you do neither of those, then you get a victory point. In a lot of matchups, you might get the first two basically for free just as you go about doing your things. You just need to put a bit more effort into making sure your opponent doesn't outflank you and doesn't hide things out of your line of sight in your deployment zone. The last one's maybe a bit more take or leave. Sometimes it is just going to make sense to go closer to your board edge or fall back with some knights. But even if that happens once or twice per game, you still should be scoring very high with this. Renew the Oaths is maybe a little bit more list specific. I'd say that this one's a bit better when you've got absolutely loads of armages in a list and you've got lots of ones that can do actions. 
The game is to do actions in the centre of the board. You get the chance to farm some honour points when you do it. And you get more points if the knight that's doing it is a big knight rather than a little one. So perhaps towards the end of the game, if it just made sense to go all in on the victory points, you could have one of your big character knights do it and get some big victory points. It's really quite a hard one to stop, though it does mean that you're basically just having an army just stand around and do nothing for a lot of the game, unless you've got something like that preceptor teaching to keep it shooting. The last really good one, I think, is Honor the House. This one's the one where you basically just need to try and keep your honor ticking up and become virtuous by the end of the game. Again, that'll often just happen regularly anyway, and it's actually easier to do if you've got Renew the Oaths on the go as well, and you're gaining honour points from that. Maybe that one's just going to be a little bit more usable if you're using some of the easier Oaths. I feel like Lay Low the Tyrants can sometimes mean that you might be losing honour points. So depending on what you're fighting, I'd say it's maybe a little bit easier if you're not using that one. Still though, another one that your opponent is really going to struggle to do too much about, and even if you don't max it, it seems like you're almost always going to score high. I'd say depending on the list that you're running, you could just literally think about running each of those in every game, and then just decide if any of the Nephilim-specific ones are good to swap out to. Duel of Honour is the fourth option for the Knight Secondaries. I'd say it's just a bit less reliable and dependent on what your opponent has as the target for your duel, but still usable in some matchups depending on what your main character is to slay their target. Next up, let's move on to the Knight Households, plus Free Blades and their Free Blade Lance. First up, when you're choosing a knight army, you're generally dedicating it to Imperialis or Mechanicus, unless you're taking the lance. And I'd say that this is much more of a decision than the Chaos Knights Codex, as you've got quite a lot of choices that are locked to either Imperialis or Mechanicus. There's stratagems that you'll gain or lose, relics, household options, martial traditions, the different exalted court upgrades, and also even your flavour of Heavy Stubber gets one or the other. On top of that, you also have a passive benefit for being Imperialis or Mechanicus. Imperialis is a bit combat focused. You get plus one to advance, charge, pile in and consolidate, and you get to ignore movement modifiers while you go there. Not a bad little boost towards rushing the enemy. On top of that, for notable stratagems, you get fight on death, and a line breaker one where you can basically hit the enemy and keep on moving, provided you can move closer to the enemy board edge, and maybe not even get hit back by a combat unit. Some notable character upgrades are the Herald 1 out of the Exalted Court for the 4 plus invuls on the Armagers, and the Banner of Solar Macarius. Plus, between Mechanicus or Imperialis, they get very good martial traditions as well, which we'll go over in a second. I feel like they have managed to make Imperialis and Mechanicus at least somewhat balanced. I feel like the standard buff of Mechanicus is just a bit better. You get plus one wound on your Armagers and plus two wounds to your Knights, plus healing a wound every turn, which can be pretty helpful and demoralising for your opponent as the game goes on. I'd say the Mechanicus Knights have the better stratagems overall, Machine Spirit Resurgence to fight on top brackets, a 5 plus save against mortal wounds, and calculated targeting can be pretty nasty as well, apply to a crusader or something, and that can vomit out quite a bunch of mortal wounds, though it does cost a lot of CP. You also do have character upgrades like Master Tactician, Master of Vox, and Princeps, all of which are pretty solid, plus the Heart of Ion. Overall, I think they've done a better balance than before to make both Mechanicus and Imperialis usable, previously it was just Mechanicus all the way. The way it generally seems to fall with people is that if you're playing a standard looking household, then in general the Mechanicus still seems to be stronger. The stratagems and that passive buff really are quite big assets, but if you're playing the Free Blade Lance, then the support that the Imperialis gets seems to be winning out, perhaps both the Martial Traditions and the Exalted Court upgrades. Then after choosing your Devotion, you have to choose which household to pick, and they get all sorts of secondary buffs of their own. In tournaments at the moment, it looks like by far the most common picks are either Mechanicus House Tyrannis or the Freeblade Lance Army of Renown, which we'll come on to just after we've talked about Freeblade things. If you are playing Mechanicus, House Tyrannis does feel like a fairly obvious pick. A 6 plus feel no pain against anything but non-mortal wounds really does double down on the durability. Tyrannus Armages in particular can feel like an absolute nightmare to shift. They've got their Ion Shields, then a minus 1 damage, an extra wound from Mechanicus and some healing as well, plus the 6 plus feel no pain and maybe even layered with stratagems like the plus one to saves in combat, rotate ion shields, or the transhuman physiology for armagers. Their other bits are pretty good as well, they've got a stratagem for a chance to resurrect a slain knight. It's a bit of a gamble happening on a 4+, plus, but sometimes that could be very disruptive, and have a knight go on a bit of a last rampage, or take an objective or something, and then in your opponent's turn they need to kill it all over again. Plus Knight of Mars is a pretty interesting warlord trait, an automatic 6 once per game, which could just basically flat out save you a bunch of damage if you got hit by something nasty, or you could use it to craftily lock in some mortal wounds with calculated targeting. Theoretically, that combos with a Castellan's Volcano Lance is absolutely massive. Otherwise, besides the Freeblade Lance, which we'll talk about in its own slides, there's things like House Raven, Griffith, and Crass, 
other popular picks. Raven gives you advance and shoot. You've got things like the Order of Companions upgrade pre-game. And the banner in violet is quite a nice buff to armagers. House Griffith, I think, is maybe the best Imperialis one. You get plus one attack in your first round of combat, which is better than most of the other buffs offered by the Imperialis households. And synergizes quite nicely with them wanting to rush into melee. Their advanced and charged warlord trait is really quite nice as well. It means that you could have something like a gallant just hurtling towards the enemy at breakneck speed. House Crash for the Mechanicus gets auto wounds on sixes in melee, a melee stratagem. A first knight upgrade for some rerolls and the headsman's mark for more damage against vehicles and titanics, just generally usable all around. And beyond that, I'd say most of the rest are a little bit on the niche side. There are some interesting things like Hawk Shroud having better honour and no degrazing, plus the Angel's Grace relic, which is quite good. Volker gets you a bit more shooting damage, and that noble combatant's martial tradition is quite interesting with further attacks from weapons that don't inflict damage. I think in general, I'd be definitely most tempted by one of these top five, though and particularly Tyrannis or the Freeblade Lance. Speaking of Freeblades, before we talk about the Lance, I thought it would make sense to talk about Freeblades themselves. There's a whole bunch of different ways that you can use them. They can be allied alongside other factions in a super heavy auxiliary. Quite nice to support some allies with obsec armages in particular that don't break detachment rules. You can potentially include Freeblades within your detachment, and they don't break your detachment rules just to give some different buffs to one individual model. Say for example, if you had a melee household and you wanted one of the ranged buffs for, say, some armager helverins, then that could be quite nice there. They could be fielded as a Freeblade Lance Army of Renown, and you could potentially use your entire army dedicated to a household based around one of the martial traditions, but I think in general that tends to be a little bit lacklustre compared with the main household benefits. In my opinion, perhaps some of the strongest ones tend to be from the Imperialist side of things rather than the Mechanicus, and if I had to pick my three favourite martial traditions, it would be these three here. Hunters of Beasts is an Imperialist one for plus one to hit against vehicles and monsters, and you gain extra honour for kills in Lalo the Tyrants, and then also plus one damage versus Titanic targets. This one works particularly nicely with what Armager Helverins often want to do. A nice damage buff against heavier targets they might want to turn their auto cannons against. Strike and Shield is quite a nice one for War Glaives, again Imperialis. Melee hits of 1 to 3 always fail against them, and they also ignore AP minus 1 in combat too. Often with Armager War Glaives, you just want to shunt them onto objectives and then try and survive there at all costs. Effectively, getting Transhuman to hit in combat is a very nice thing to layer with the other defensive buffs that you can put on them, and it's really quite a nice to have. Otherwise, there's Noble Combatants, again really interesting for Warglaives in my opinion. If you make an attack that isn't a sweep profile of your weapon, then you get to make an additional attack if it doesn't inflict damage. Just with average rolling, that often adds up to a pretty ludicrous damage buff, around the 50% type mark against a lot of targets. Though not working on sweeps does mean that it won't be that helpful against one wound infantry and things. Still though, it makes them massively vicious in combat, and another very common pick. Otherwise, besides those, things like Blessed Arms or Machine Focus can be quite nice Mechanicus Firepower ones, just giving you a little bit of extra range, extra shots, or extra rerolls. And there's one called Paragons of Honor, which means that a big knight could get an extra oath stacked on it. That could be interesting depending on which ones you've selected. Plenty more of them are usable though, but I'd say that these are perhaps some of the most standout. Next up, as we mentioned it a fair few times, here's the Freeblade Lance Army of Renown, something that you need to commit to as an entire army, but kind of functions as a bit of an alternate playstyle for knights, and almost like a different style of household. It does seem to be one of, if not the strongest way to play Imperial Knights right now, and it is quite fun too, as it means that you have to pick different martial traditions for each one of your knights, plus they get a few more passive buffs than free blades will get normally. It seems to be at least fairly popular with very armager heavy lists, with only one or two big knights to support them. On top of the martial traditions that we just talked through, there's Indomitable Heroes. It's kind of a halfway house between the Mechanicus and Imperialis benefits, giving you the extra healing and the Ignore's movement modifiers, so a little bit of both worlds there. On top of that, you still get to use your Bondsman things with the free blade armages, plus you can also make free use of all the Exalted Court upgrades, plus you can also have different units within your army being Mechanicus or Imperialis. It often seems like people want to go mainly Imperialis on this, with maybe just a couple of supporting Mechanicus shooting armages like Helverins or Moiraxes. Otherwise, besides this big flexibility of tethering each knight with a different martial tradition, you also get to stack two relics on one knight for two CP if you should so desire. You could potentially have two relics and two warlord traits on one really stacked Questorus knight maybe. And there's also a one CP strength from exile stratagem to reroll hits and wounds of one, it provided you've got no friendly knights within 12 inches of it. That could be pretty interesting on something like a shooty castellan or crusader manning the deployment zone perhaps. 
I'd say the main advantage is lots of bonded armagers that have those very nice imperialist martial traditions, plus the Mechanicus style healing, plus some helpful stratagems. Next up, let's talk through the different data sheets in the army with the various different flavours of knight that you can field. First up, we've got the staples of the army in the Questorus knights. I feel like you're almost always going to want them for multiple different reasons. They satisfy the conditions of your knight lancers pretty easily. The bondsman abilities are maybe some of the strongest things in the codex, and these guys are the ones that dole them out. Plus, they make efficient use of stratagems, and certain relics and warlord traits can only be applied to them. They just really feel like the units that you're meant to build around. Out of the Questorus Knight data sheets, again, I feel that most of them are really quite usable, and none are too far behind. But if I had to pick my favourite two, it would probably be the Knight Paladin and the Knight Errant. Both of them reasonable enough mixed damage dealers, with their rapid fire battle cannon or thermal cannon, plus a combat weapon of some flavour but really it's more their bondsman abilities that set them apart. The Knight Paladin's buff is a very strong reroll once to hit and to wound for bonded units. It can be nice on armagers or with a princeps on something like a crusader or another big knight, and it can be a particularly good one to use that Helm Dominatus on. Otherwise, the Knight Errant just pairs spectacularly well with armager warglaives and using that full tilt stratagem. The bonded knights get to advance and charge, so have a crazy threat range that could be hurtling all the way across the board, potentially taking far-flung objectives with their obsec and killing the infantry units in combat that were holding them. I feel like they might be the most standout, but going through the list, Crusaders, I think are very scary when you stack them with maximal buffs. Say, for example, get some rerolls from them for a Princeps Paladin, blessed by the Sacristans for mortal wounds on sixes, Endless Fury for more shots on that Avenger Gatling cannon, and potentially more besides from something like an Exalted Court upgrade. And between that little lot, you've got a unit that is just going to obliterate most of the things that it fires at. If you're playing Mechanicus and you want to turn on even more juice, you could feed in that 3CP calculated targeting one. I believe that on average with that little lot, you average something like 15 odd mortal wounds, never mind the rest of its damage. The Knight Gallant is cheap, expendable, and savage in melee, the sort of knight that you can just throw up towards the enemy as something that they have to deal with, and if they don't, then it's almost guaranteed to break things. Perhaps quite nice with Sanctuary for the 4 plus invul, the Griffith Warlord trait for advance and charge, and when it dies, if you use the auto explode on it, it could potentially take a really big chunk out of the enemy army if they do decide to swarm it and counter charge it. I'd say Knight Preceptors are usable, but maybe not enormously stand out, again perhaps because the Bondsman abilities are quite so good, plus I'm a little bit unconvinced as to how strong the Laz Impulsor is. I'd say the teachings are usable though, if you just want raw power out of the nearby Arbiters, then giving them exploding sixes to hit and a six plus feel no pain both seem great, and you could also do slightly cleverer things like using it to splash Bondsman abilities onto more Knights than you should be able to, or the action and shoot one if you want to be repeatedly doing that renew the oaths thing in the centre of the board. I would say that missing out on Bondsman abilities though does tend to be quite sad. Canis Rex I think is really quite decent for the points at 440. With his Freedom's Hand Relic he's not really far off the fightiness of a Gallant, plus he's got a pretty decent big gun, and also he can give out his knightly teachings as well. It does mean though that you don't get your free choice of Warlord Traits, Relics or Exalted Courts and things. I feel like he's fairly usable in the Free Blade Lance, or potentially if you're fielding a single allied knight, but otherwise maybe just tends to be a little bit on the niche side. Finally we've got the Knight Warden, where I think that the main selling point is that Gatling Cannon. It is a good general purpose gun, but maybe I feel like his bond abilities are one of the weakest out of them, and just don't have the raw amount of exciting stuff that the Paladin or the Errant have. Still by no means bad though, very usable, and the heroic intervention could help Armagers defend central objectives. Next up we've got the Armagers, and we have been talking about how to buff them or review long. I'd argue for raw power they might be the strongest knights in the codex when buffed, and typically in a lot of the top tournament lists they'll often be making up around half or over the points in terms of investment in them. Typically I'd usually want slightly more warglaives than helverins if there was an option. The warglaives are the ones that can be scrappy on the front line, and it doesn't matter too much if you happen to lose one. Their thermal spear is pretty dangerous and works quite nicely with the lay low the tyrant rerolls, plus as mentioned they can get that super long charge with a knight errant if you happen to have one and then just putting them on objectives and getting 5 obsec models there is really good. With the bondsman abilities, they're very tough as well, so it's a pretty ideal thing to have on the front line. Armager Helverins, I maybe want a few less of them, and to have them hover around the backfield. The auto cannons with their flat damage 3 are pretty good at chewing through most targets. They should stack some nice saves on anything from hordes to elite infantry to vehicles, and if they can just keep that long-range firepower coming while taking some home field objectives, and maybe doing the occasional action or thing, then it all seems good. I quite like the support from the Bondsman abilities from things like Paladins or Crusaders to up that firepower. For the Armager Moiraxes, I feel like maybe they're slightly more niche, 
but still pretty usable depending on what you're expecting to be fighting. I feel like perhaps their biggest incentive is the lightning locks at mass fire at strength 6, AP minus 2 and damage 1. You average 12 hits out of a single one even with no buffs. And if you want dedicated anti-horde in a night list then they're pretty much the best choice. The bad cleanser and siege claws are also fairly interesting as well though. Otherwise we've got the Dominus Knights and the other Forge World options, all of them perhaps a little bit more neat in their application. After the two Dominuses, the Castellan I think is far superior to the Valiant in the latest codex. The Castellan is basically paying a bit of a premium just for some absolutely massive anti-tank fire, and it does have some advantages like a native 2 plus armor save and more wounds, though you are missing out on those all important bondsman abilities, maybe being one of the reasons why people often overlook them for the Questorus. If you just want raw shooting might out for a big knight though, then it's really not a bad way to go. It could be an interesting choice for the Forge Master trait, we're giving it minus one damage in your own deployment zone, and then just have it firing out its massive firepower from there each turn. You could do some interesting combos like the huge 4 CP mortal wound combo with Tyrannis and that auto 6. That could have that volcano lance, provided you can get one hit with volcano lance. That basically has you dealing out an automatic huge amount of mortal wounds on one target. But basically any other shooting buffs that you can put on this really are quite nice. The Heart of Ion could be quite interesting to give you plus one to wound on that Plasma Decimator maybe. And Blessed by the Sacristan should give you a few extra mortal wounds with all the various guns that this thing's going to be firing away with. Perhaps the biggest downside is limited melee and being pretty limited with synergies with the other knights though. In any case, I do think it's far stronger than the Knight Valiant, which is just a lot more short range, which isn't great on a knight that's bad in melee, and unfortunately just doesn't have the raw damage outputs to make up for that. Maybe that Thundercoil Harpoon or something should have been ignoring invul saves like quite a lot of the other things in 40k seem to these days. Otherwise, for the other Forge World Knights from Imperial Armor, we've already talked about the Moiraxes, which might be the single most usable. Otherwise, I'd say the next most interesting is the Knight Questor Magera, Basically a Questorus Knight without Bondsman abilities, but does just bring a lot of raw power to the game with a few big guns. Plus it gets a nasty siege claw in combat and a 5 plus invul save in melee as well, both of which are pretty nice things. Again, maybe could be an interesting generalist to target with those Paladin rerolls if you've got a Princeps. Otherwise, I'd say that the Serastus Knights are largely overcosted, and not having the Questorus keyword is quite a bad thing for them in the new codex with all the options. I'd say perhaps the Castigator is one of the most interesting. It's got that Bolt Cannon, which is basically an Avenger Gatling Cannon with more shots. Could be interesting enough to target with anything that buffs one gun, like say the Heart of Ion. Finally, the Acastus Knights basically feel like Dominus Knights, but worse. I think I'd typically want to take a Knight Castellan over any of those. I feel like you could probably take a good 100 points off their chassis, and it wouldn't be too much. Finally, before we take a look at a couple of army lists, I thought I might briefly touch on knights with allies. Generally, I'd say that Imperial Knights aren't an army that is particularly desperate to have allies within their list. They don't usually want to be spending CP for extra detachments. And if you're going for an ally that isn't an agent of the Imperium somehow, then you'll basically be giving up a ridiculous amount of CP, both the command points for the extra detachment, plus breaking your knightly oaths and chivalric code and things, and that would cost you another 5 command points over the game normally. Basically you're paying at least 7 command points to get a further detachment in allies, plus giving up those amazing knight secondaries, and overall it's just realistically not going to be worth it. Maybe the most tempting thing that I have seen from time to time is an Inquisitor as an auxiliary support, that will cost 2 CP plus the points for him, and I guess theoretically could allow you a couple of extra secondaries, such as mental interrogation, or potentially raised banners if you're feeling ambitious. I'd argue that this probably isn't usually worth it though, given how good the knight secondaries are just off their own steam. I guess otherwise for Imperial Agents you could also do something like an Assassin theoretically, but at the points cost that they are at the moment, I'm just not sure they're going to be worth it plus the CP. Perhaps far more interesting are using Imperial Knights as allies themselves, for 3 command points you can field 3 armagers in a super heavy auxiliary detachment. They'll be a free blade so as not to break the other army's army wide special rules and can bring some interesting things to the table. I generally say that the armagers are generally going to be the way to go in terms of allied knights like this. Unfortunately the big knights I think just don't really get to their maximal efficiency without the layered relics and warlord traits and exalted court things and you can't take any of that if you're just taking them as an ally. Plus the armagers do get their fast moving objective secured which is pretty great. And I'd say maybe the biggest thing that they can often add to other Imperial factions is some long range fire support with the Armager Helverins. Armies like Grey Knights or Adeptus Custodes genuinely would have some decent battlefield roles for them. Fast moving general purpose firepower with Obsec has the potential to do pretty well in those kind of lists. If you were taking Helverins, you could take Hunters of Beasts maybe. Or if you went for Warglaives for a bit more front line punch, you could think about Noble Combatants or Strike and Shield. Both of those are very nice to have on the front line. 
Finally, I thought we'd just put things together and take a look at a couple of top tournament lists from Imperial Knights recently. They really do have quite a lot of strong showings to choose from. As the most popular list, I thought we'd take a look at one Freeblade Lance Army of Renown and one House Tyrannis, and just to see one example of a setup from both of those. First up, we've got this Freeblade Lance list, which was run by Dan Sammons, who used it to take first at Flying Monkey Con. This one's very armature heavy, and it's actually been fielded in a super heavy auxiliary detachment as well as the main super heavy one. It looks like just to fit in that last armager Moirax to get a really good anti-horde focus one. The list is led by an absolutely stacked knight errant. This will allow the armager Wargraves to advance and charge which is very nice. And it takes the Reaper Chainsword plus the top mounted Storm Spear Rocket Pod for a bit of missile goodness. This guy has the Helm Dominatus Relic which provided it doesn't die will allow you to steadily get more and more armagers under its buffing spell. So by the end of the game you could have an awful lot of Wargraves running around with advance and charge plus minus one damage. It's also got Iron Bulwark for the 4 plus envelope range. The Herald Exalted Court upgrade so any of the armagers that it bonds will also get the 4 plus invul as well. So they'll be super tanky and hard to kill. And for the Martial Tradition it also picks up Mythic Hero allowing it to personally count the honour points as higher than it normally is, so it's got a good chance of getting virtuous and getting objectives secured plus those automatic sixes. These chivalric oaths taken for the army would defend the realm for the command points and lay low the tyrants for re-rolls, which goes quite a long way when you've got so many knights on the table. Otherwise, besides that, there's a fairly even mix of fatty warglaives and shooty helverins and moiraxes, maybe tending to go a little bit heavier on the shooty armagers than most perhaps. The warglaives on the front line largely take stubbers, one has a melter gun, Three of them have strike and shield for the transhuman to hit in melee, and two of them have noble competence for the extra damage if they're fighting something tough. For the shooting knights, we then have three helverins. They take the hunters of beasts for the plus one to hit against vehicles and things, and one is the warlord that takes the bastard's helm, the one that gives him and a friend plus one to wound against their targets. There's then three knight moraxes, two melee ones with siege claws and rad cleansers. They're mechanicus with blessed arms for extra range on those rad cleansers. Fairly savage flamers that wound non-vehicles on a 2+, plus and also have a big damage 3. They'll be fairly brutal if they do catch any enemies in combat as well. The Siege Claws get a damage D6 plus 2 if they happen to be against vehicles or titanics. With the Assault Rask Cleansers, it does look like they could be a good target for just zooming forward with the Errants. You'd be able to move and advance them very, very far, and then still be able to fire those shots off before they charge. Finally, in the Super Heavy Auxiliary Detachment, we have one single Armored Moirax that's an anti-horde dedicated knight. He has two lightning locks and takes last of their line which gives them re-rolls against hordes. I guess that means that you could fish for those extra sixes if you wanted to and potentially be spitting out a pretty crazy amount of damage against anything with six models or more in the unit. Overall looks like a really cool free blade lance list with a whole load of interesting things going on. The big errant linchpin at the back to give all the knights bond mill abilities and good invuls. A whole ton of solid warglaives on the front lines with the decent combat buffs. And I think that armage of Moirax with the lightning locks is really quite cool. You could potentially have that with plus one to wound with the bastard's helm as well, as well as the full hit rerolls. The Siege Claw and Rag Cleanser ones are interesting as well. A pretty fun alternative to just taking more Warglaives. You'd certainly have enough armagers to dominate the primary objective, and probably be doing that Renew the Oath secondary as well. Finally, for one further option, we've got one strong Tyrannus Knight list. This one run at a recent GT by a James Mann, who used it to take second at Dragon's Lair. This one's just a single Tyrannus Super Heavy Detachment with Defend the Realm and Lay Low the Tyrants once more. And this one takes three big knights and four little knights. Perhaps one of the main combos being a big knight paladin with princeps, giving you reroll ones to hit and wound on a knight crusader with a thermal cannon. And the knight crusader is just juiced up with a whole bunch of other upgrades, including Endless Fury, Knight of Mars to allow you a single automatic six, and Master Tactician with Blessed Arms. That gives it extra range and extra shots on those stubbers. Could definitely be an interesting one for the 3 CP 6s become mortal wound stratagem if you want it. Otherwise, there's a dangerous knight gallant with the sanctuary relic for a 4 plus invul save, plus revered knight for fights first and extra honor points. He takes master of law for the preceptor upgrade, where he takes the knight's faith for the 6 plus or 5 plus feel no pain boost. That'd be quite a nice one layered up with the Arbiter Warglaives, who I'm sure he'll be advancing alongside with. Then we do have those three Armager Warglaves, they all take stubbers, and one Armager Helver in to capture objectives in the background and chip in with a little bit more firepower. Seems to be at least a fairly common setup for Tyrannus list to have a Paladin buffing a Crusader, and then your choice of another big knight beyond that buffing some Armagers. Looks very nasty, the Crusader damage output will be scary. Lots of raw power in this one, and three big knights is always quite good fun to see on the table.
So with the army list talked through, I think we'll leave that there for Imperial Knights this time. Let me know your thoughts on the faction down in the comments below. And as always, if I've made any major errors or you think I've missed some important combos that should be talked about, please let me know down in the comments as well. Hopefully I'll be looking to make a few more videos on the Imperial Knights in the not too distant future, so feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics if you'd like to see that. I do tend to post faction reviews in general semi-regularly, and I'll try and keep something interesting for 40k coming just about every day. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that All Specs Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that link down in the video description if you're interested. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, an absolutely massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.